These painted lady larvae are from a commercial supplier. They are shipped in a relatively small space, but they all seem to get along. Up to six larvae are shipped. And when adult, they affix themselves to the top of the jar that has a cloth. This can be removed and put in a flight cage for the adult butterflies. The larvae on the left is not quite at the pupal phase, whereas there's one relatively active larvae on the right that is almost fully in the pupal phase. The painted lady is one of the most familiar butterflies in the world. It is found on nearly all continents and in all climates. The species is cultivated commercially and larvae are often sold in kits, as here, oftentimes for children to study and appreciate metamorphosis. As with many insect species, even well-known ones, there are aspects of their behavior that are not fully studied. Painted ladies will mate year-round in warm climates, but they do not mate during the winter in cooler places. Females will lay about 500 eggs in total. Each egg is singly laid. Mating and reproduction also takes place throughout the mass migrations that this species undertakes, producing multiple generations throughout the migration. The butterflies are present in cold regions only because of their impressive ability to migrate long distances from their warm weather breeding areas. Eight generations in a year can be produced in laboratory conditions. This butterfly often migrates into colder regions in spring and fall, making it the, the widest distribution of any butterfly species. Adults stay in place and hibernate only in the south and in areas with mild winters. The number of broods in any one place may vary from year to year because it is not a permanent resident of the whole of the United States. Every year, painted lady butterflies make huge migrations from Africa to Europe and back again. They also do this from Mexico to the northern United States and beyond to Canada and back. The migrations can be up to 15,000 kilometers or 9,320 miles. In the spring, they begin moving north as the temperatures become too warm in Africa or Mexico. Each fall, painted ladies vacate Canada and most of the U.S. for the winter. They remain active only in parts of the extreme southern U.S. and in Mexico. When spring arrives, they push northward to breed, sometimes arriving in the northeast in large numbers. They are not as predictable or as well-known as monarchs. Southern California is well-known as an entry point for butterflies which were born in Mexico. They can travel through California all the way to Canada. The butterflies travel as long as their fat reserves last before breeding. Multiple generations of these insects can reach all the way to the Pacific Northwest. In 2005, it was estimated that billions of butterflies made it across the southern border due to a tremendous crop of wildflowers in Mexico. Almost the entire North American population of painted lady butterflies migrates to West Texas and Northern Mexico during the winter. As caterpillars, they feed on desert annual plants. Their favorite are the families of mallows, borages, and thistles and their relatives. And then once butterflies, they begin traveling north. They can live up to about six weeks, but most don't live that long. On their way back, the next generations of butterflies will begin making the trip south. In California, the largest number of butterflies are expected on the eastern side 
of the Sierra Nevada mountains. They can travel at such high altitudes that people are unaware of their migration. A similar phenomena happens in Europe, with some of the butterflies traveling north to south across the Sahara in Africa and others to Ethiopia and Eritrea, and then the population can return. Painted lady butterflies are good at generating body heat through muscle contractions. This allows them to fly at lower air temperatures. The painted ladies have the highest observed altitude record among all butterflies at around 22,000 feet. Of course, in this case, the migration will largely be invisible from the ground. Only a few types of birds actually catch the butterflies on the wing, with most being eaten if they are cold or flying slowly or taking water near mud puddles on the ground. Painted ladies have unusual migration patterns for insects. The painted lady is an eruptive migrant, meaning that it migrates independent of any seasonal or geographic patterns. Some evidence suggests that painted lady migrations may be linked to the El Nino climate pattern in North America. In Mexico and some other regions, it appears that migration is sometimes related to overpopulation. The migrating populations that move from North Africa to Europe may include millions of butterflies and migrating populations numbering hundreds of thousands of individuals are common. In spring, painted ladies fly low when migrating, usually only 6 to 12 feet above the ground. This makes them highly visible to butterfly watchers, but also rather susceptible to colliding with cars. At other times, evidence suggests that painted ladies migrate at such high altitudes that they are not observed at all, simply appearing in a new region unexpectedly. But specifically, painted ladies are often encountered in gardens. Males perch and patrol during the afternoon. In the western states in America, males usually perch on shrubs on hilltops, while in the east, males perch on bare ground in open areas. On overcast days, painted ladies can often be found on the ground, huddling in small depressions. On sunny days, the butterflies prefer open areas filled with colorful flowers. Caterpillars live in silk nests and eat leaves. And this is one of the problems of this as a species for children. They make a huge mess in their cage, but despite this, that is the way they would like to live. They're not bothered by having their frass in a large net in their cage. The painted lady caterpillar is usually black with yellowish lines on each side, as well as a black head. It makes a nest by rolling the edges of a leaf together and securing it with silk. The roll doesn't have to be complete, there could simply be webbing in a leaf. A new nest is made after each molt. The nests are easy to spot on the host plant because they are often messy and filled with the caterpillar's droppings or frass. The early instar larva spends most of the day concealed, feeding in and around the nest. Later instar larvae often wander out to feed at dawn and dusk. Hence, their dark color does not offer them up as a prey item for potential predators like birds. In uh, many cases, when the larvae emerge from their nest, they will spin a silk thread to keep them attached to the leaves. This is like a spider. Uh, this is a precautionary measure to make sure that the caterpillar doesn't fall down. Painted ladies can cover a lot of ground up to 100 miles per day during their migration. A painted lady is capable of reaching a speed of nearly 30 miles per hour. 
painted ladies reach northern areas well ahead of some of their more famous migrating cousins, like monarch butterflies. And because they get such an early start to their spring travel, migrating painted ladies are able to feed on the flowers of spring annuals. The painted lady prefers nectar from composites from three and six feet high, especially thistles, aster, cosmos, blazing star, ironweed, and jopai weed. Flowers from other families that are also visited include red clover, buttonbush, privet, and milkweeds. The internet allows people to observe butterflies and participate in scientific research, particularly to help scientists establish which routes are used at which times. A good example is e-butterfly. This is a silk moth cocoon. The pupa is encased by the cocoon which is made of silk. Moth pupae are usually dark in color and are either formed in underground cells loose in the soil, or their pupa is contained in a protective silk case called a cocoon. This is different from butterflies. This butterfly has just emerged from the chrysalis and is looking for a vertical surface. This butterfly has just emerged from the chrysalis and it is inflating its wings from hemolymph in its abdomen. It is also joining together the two separate pieces of its proboscis. This butterfly has just emerged in the morning from its chrysalis. Its body is still relatively full of hemolymph and the wings are not fully inflated. Butterfly adults are characterized by their four scale covered wings, which gives the Lepidoptera, Greek for scale wing, their name. These scales give butterfly wings their color. They are pigmented with melanins that give them blacks and browns, as well as uric acid derivatives and flavones, which give them yellows. Many of the blues, greens, reds, and iridescent colors are created by structural coloration produced by the microstructures of these scales and hairs on the wings. Nearly all butterflies are diurnal. They have relatively bright colors and hold their wings vertically above their bodies when at rest. This is unlike the majority of moths, which fly by night, are often cryptically colored, in other words, well camouflaged, and either hold their wings flat, touching the surface on which the moth is standing, or fold them closely over their bodies. One easy way to tell the difference between a moth and a butterfly are the antennae. Butterfly have club-shaped antennae at the tips. Butterflies can only feed on liquids, in nature usually nectar. When a new adult emerges from the chrysalis, its mouth is in two separate pieces, as here. Using palpi located adjacent to the proboscis, the butterfly begins working the two parts together to form a singular tubular proboscis. Newly emerged butterfly curling and uncurling the proboscis over and over is testing out the organ. Butterflies have taste receptors on their feet to help them find their host plants and to locate food. A female butterfly lands on different plants drumming the leaves with her feet until the plant releases its juices. When she has identified the right plant, she lays her eggs. A butterfly will also step on flowers to see if there is any sugar. But a butterfly cannot live on sugar alone. It also needs minerals. To supplement its diet of nectar, a butterfly will occasionally sip from mud puddles, which are rich in minerals and salts. This behavior called puddling occurs more often in male butterflies that regularly patrol their territories. Within about 10 to 12 feet, butterfly eyesight is probably quite good. Anything beyond that distance probably gets a little blurry. Butterflies rely on their eyesight for vital tasks like finding food and finding mates. In addition to seeing some of the colors we can see, butterflies can see a range of ultraviolet colors invisible to the human eye. 
flowers display ultraviolet markings that act as traffic signals to incoming pollinators like butterflies as well as bees. Here is the startled response from the front. A butterfly will snap its wings open and at the tip of the wings there are white eye spots that would confuse a predator like a bird. Some flowers are not ideal for butterfly feeding like this gladioli which is perhaps better for bees than it is for butterflies. There are many lists of food plants butterflies can easily imbibe from. Butterflies need an ideal body temperature of about 85 degrees Fahrenheit to fly. Since they're cold-blooded animals, they can't regulate their own body temperatures. If the air temperature falls below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, butterflies are rendered immobile. When the air temperatures range between 82 degrees and 100 degrees, butterflies can fly with ease. Cooler days and mornings require a butterfly to warm up its flight muscles, either by shivering or basking in the sun. Butterflies can get overheated when the temperatures soar above 100 degrees Fahrenheit and may seek shade to cool down. It's also a good idea for humans if the butterflies think it's too hot, it's time to go in. Butterflies can require a lot of space if kept in captivity. As an example, groups of two to eight painted lady butterflies have been observed to fly in circles around each other for about one to five seconds before separating. This has been said by some to be a courtship dance, but in reality, butterflies are territorial. To establish and defend their territories, adult males perch in the late afternoon in areas where females are most likely to appear. Once the male spots a female of the same species, he begins his pursuit. If a foreign butterfly is male, the original male will give chase, flying vertically for a few feet before returning to his perch. Once it emerges from the chrysalis as an adult, a butterfly has only about two to four weeks to live in most cases. Some of the smallest butterflies, like perhaps the aptly named blues, may only survive a few days. Butterflies that overwinter as adults, like monarchs, can live as long as nine months and in rare cases up to two years. There is a general decline in butterfly populations. Many butterflies emerge from a chrysalis in the springtime, and at the same time, they are doused in pesticides. Other threats are a general loss of open spaces with fewer food plants for the larvae and flowers for the adults, as well as changing agricultural practices. More intensive agriculture leads to fewer butterfly-friendly plants in the edges of crop fields. Climate change might also yield higher temperatures that can dry plants out and make them inedible. The future of butterflies is bleak without serious human intervention. This afternoon, I'd like to say a few things about Cupid and Psyche as it relates to butterflies. Psyche is often represented with butterfly wings in antiquity, and this is a convention that extends to the present period. It should be noted that in the classical world, butterflies had this particular association with the soul, but this is not the case in related cultures like in ancient Egypt, where the butterfly has no connotation like that. We can trace the origins of these associations to a particular myth, and we can find evidence even earlier that the Greeks appreciated the psyche or soul like a butterfly. Eros or Cupid in the Roman world and psyche is a story originally from the Metamorphosis. This work is also called the Golden Ass. It is written in the second century AD. There's some debate but it seems as if the author's name is Apuleius. The story involves overcoming obstacles to the love between Psyche, the Greek soul or breath of life, and Eros, 
the God of love. At the end, a marriage results, but not without something akin to the labors of Heracles. Although the only extended narrative from antiquity is that of Apuleius, Eros and Psyche appear in Greek art as early as the 4th century BC. The story has been retold in poetry, drama, and opera, and depicted widely in painting, sculpture, and other arts, even to the present period. The first illustration is a sarcophagus panel of Cupid and Psyche in the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Cupid is represented as a boy or even a baby with bird wings. Psyche is a girl or young woman with butterfly wings, and they both support a portrait either of a deceased person or of someone designed to represent the deceased. But back to Apuleius, uh, the golden ass drew generally on imagery such as the ascent of the winged soul, as discussed in the Phaedrus, and the union with the divine achieved by the soul through the agency of love, as discussed in the Symposium. The imagery in these sources, again, suggests the soul is related to butterflies. Some of the extant examples suggest that in antiquity, Cupid and Psyche could have a religious or mystical meaning. Rings bearing their likeness, several of which come from Roman Britain, may have served an amuletic purpose. Engraved gems from Britain represent spiritual torment with the image of Cupid torching a butterfly. It probably has a spe specific meaning that is now lost. The allegorical pairing depicts perfection of human love in an integrated embrace of body and soul. Of course, psyche, which would give psychology its root, is, Greek, is the Greek symbol for transcendent or immortal life after death. On sarcophagi, the couple often seem to represent an allegory of love overcoming death a sentiment which is not unique to Christians and extends well before in the pagan period. But back to the story. A king and queen had three daughters. The youngest and most beautiful was Psyche, whose admirers, neglecting the proper worship of the love goddess Venus, instead prayed and made offerings to the mortal Psyche. It was said by the people that she was the second coming of Venus, or perhaps she was the daughter of Venus from the union with a mortal. Not surprisingly, the goddess Venus is offended being compared to a mortal. Venus sends her son, Cupid, to shoot Psyche with an arrow so that she may fall in love with something hideous as a punishment. He instead scratches himself with one of his own arrows. He falls deeply in love with Psyche. Although Psyche's two sisters have married, she has yet to find a husband. Her father consults the oracle of Apollo, and the response is unsettling. The king is to expect no human son-in-law, but a reptile. Psyche is arrayed in funeral attire and conveyed by a procession to the peak of a rocky crag. Marriage and death are merged into this single rite, and the west wind bears her up to meet her match. She is deposited in a lovely meadow where she falls asleep. Psyche wakes at the edge of a grove. She finds a marvelous house with golden columns, a disembodied voice tells her to make herself comfortable. She is guided to a bedroom where she has sex with an unknown entity who always departs before sunrise and forbids her to look upon him. She becomes pregnant as a result. After much cajoling from Psyche, Cupid, oh, Psyche still does not know his true identity, permits the west wind to carry her sisters up for a visit. When they see the splendor in which Psyche lives, they become envious 
and direct her to uncover her husband's true identity. They noted that the oracle said her husband would be a winged serpent, but the sisters have a plan. One night, after Cupid falls asleep, Psyche brings out a dagger and a lamp she had hidden in her room. She wants to see and to kill the monster. But the light reveals Cupid. She spills hot oil from the lamp and wakes him. He flees and she roams the earth in search of the god. The image is from a mosaic from Antioch. Psyche is clearly indicated because she has butterfly wings. This mosaic dates from the third, third century AD and clearly relates to this passage. Psyche visits first one sister and then the other, and both sisters are seized with a renewed envy upon learning that Cupid is Psyche's secret husband. Each sister attempts to offer herself as a replacement by climbing the rocky crag and casting herself upon the west wind. Both fall to their deaths. In the course of her wanderings, Psyche comes upon a temple of Demeter in great disarray. Inside she finds grain offerings, garlands, and agricultural implements that obviously no one has tended. She puts everything in good order and Psyche prays for aid. But Demeter, admitting that Psyche deserves her aid, says that she cannot act against her fellow goddess. A similar incident occurs at the temple of Hera, the queen of the gods. Psyche realizes that she must approach Venus, perhaps do something for Venus and ask for her aid. Venus turns Psyche over to her two handmaids, worry and sadness, and they torture her. The goddess then throws before her a great mass of mixed seeds, demanding that she sort them into separate heaps by dawn. A kind ant takes pity on Psyche and assembles a fleet of insects to accomplish this task. This is perhaps the first reference to insects in the tale and suggests that Psyche might be seen as queen of the insects. At dawn, Venus sends a second task for Psyche. She is to cross a river and fetch golden wool from violent sheep belonging to the sun god Helios. They graze on the other side of the river. Psyche's only intention is to drown herself on the way, but instead she is saved by instructions from a divinely inspired talking reed. This type of reed is used to make musical instruments. And the reed says that Psyche can simply gather wool caught on shrubs. She's exposed to no danger. For Psyche's third task, she is given a crystal vessel in which to collect the black water spewed by the source of the rivers Styx and Cositus. This source is guarded by dragons. In this case, Zeus himself takes pity on Psyche and sends his eagle to battle the dragons and retrieve the water for her. The last trial Venus imposes on Psyche is a visit to the underworld. She is to take a box and obtain in it a dose of the beauty of Proserpina, the queen of the underworld. Psyche climbs a tower planning to throw herself off. She clearly knows that it's not the underworld. But the tower tells her where she will find the entrance to the underworld. The tower offers specific instructions about what she is supposed to do in the underworld, and particularly what is she supposed to bring. The speaking tower warns Psyche to maintain her silence as she passes by several figures, including a lamed man driving a mule loaded with sticks, a dead man swimming in the river that separates the world of the living from the world of the dead, and an old woman weaving. These, the tower warms, will seek to divert her by pleading for her help, 
but she must ignore them. She is to bring cakes and treats for distracting Cerberus, the three-headed watchdog. And she is also to bring two coins for Charon, the ferryman. She needs to make a return trip and pay her way. Proserpina grants Psyche's humble entreaty. As soon as Psyche re-enters the light of day, she is overcome by curiosity, and she can't resist opening the box in the hope of enhancing her own beauty. She finds nothing inside, but is sent into a deep, unnatural sleep. This is a common uh, image used by painters of the last several hundred years, but unfortunately, because Psyche is not easily depicted with wings here, I did not include them. But back to the story, Cupid finds Psyche and he draws the sleep from her face and replaces it in the box. He, he wakes her up by pricking her with an arrow and he instructs her to take the box to Venus. Meanwhile, Cupid takes his case to Zeus who gives his consent for a marriage. Zeus has Hermes convene an assembly of the gods in the theater of heaven where he makes a public statement of approval. Zeus warns Venus to back off and he gives Psyche ambrosia, the drink of immortality. This is so the couple can be united in an equal marriage. Their union, Zeus says, will redeem Cupid from his history of provoking adultery and sordid liaisons perhaps specifically relating to Zeus's sordid liaisons, many of them. There's an image of Cupid and Psyche from the Berlin Museum dating to the second century AD. And again, Psyche has butterfly wings. The wedding provides closure for the narrative structure as well as for the love story. Her odyssey started when she entered into a false marriage preceded by funeral rites. Her journey ends with the correct ritual procedure for a real marriage. There are many ways to interpret this story. A good example is Boccaccio, who said the marriage of Cupid and Psyche symbolized the union between the soul and God. Painters of the last 200 years have depicted Psyche in a very sympathetic manner. A good example is John Wegelin, 1849 to 1927. He was an English painter, active from 1877 to 1910. He specialized in figurative paintings with lush backgrounds, typically landscapes or garden scenes. He painted many subjects inspired by classical antiquity and mythology, and here he paints Psyche with wings. Motifs from this story occur in several fairy tales including Cinderella and Rumpelstiltskin. To discuss Cinderella first, and then to move on to the Little Mermaid. But in the grim version, Cinderella is giving the task of sorting lentils and peas from ash. She is aided by birds, just as ants help Psyche in sorting the grain and legumes. This was Im imposed on her by Venus. Like Cinderella, Psyche has two envious sisters who compete with her for the most desirable husband. Cinderella's sisters mutilate their own feet to emulate her, while Psyche's sisters turn out even worse. They're dashed to death when they try to float on the air. And again, this might be a reference to a butterfly. The sisters attempt to float on the air, but only Psyche can. In Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid, the Little Mermaid is given a dagger by her sisters who uh, want to seemingly help her, but in fact, they want to trick her into slaying her prince while he is asleep. She can't slay her prince, and of course, things turn out well for the Little Mermaid as they turn out well for Psyche. It is interesting to speculate who first pioneered the association of the soul with butterflies, but it's a very enduring image and it's one 
that survives well to the present and shows every indication of living long into the future. Thank you very much for your time.